Welcome everyone to the first of a series of webinars on school nutrition policy sponsored by the LA County Department of Public Health and the, and the Renew LA County Initiative in collaboration with the California Food Policy Advocates and the Urban and Environmental Policy Institute. My name is Michelle Wood and I work with the LA County Department of Public Health and the Renew LA County Initiative and will be moderating today's webinar. We are very excited about today's panel, Rethinking the Lunchroom, Strategies to Increase Healthier Food Selection and Consumption. There was an overwhelming interest from other communities across the country and we wanted to open up the webinar um, to everyone who was interested in this topic. We have um, 360 folks who have reg registered from this, for this webinar from 38 states around the country. Very excited about the webinar. This webinar is made possible by funding from the Department of Health and Human Services through the LA County Department of Public Health. There's one quick um, item I wanted to mention before we get started. This webinar is being recorded and we will send a link of the recording after today's panel. I'm focused on the line, make sure that they have muted their lines. <laughs> For those who are, um, we're hearing a little bit of um, feedback on the line, if folks can push star six to mute their lines. For the panelists on the line, if, if before we get started into the presentation, can you push star six? We're hearing some interference in the background. Once again, push star six to mute your line. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I apologize for a little bit of the interference in the background. To give some background, Renew LA County is an initiative funded by the U.S. Health and Human Services and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Community Food Prevention to Work Initiative, which gave LA County $16 million over a two-year period for activities addressing the obesity epidemic. Renew seeks to improve nutrition, increase physical activity, and reduce obesity in LA County. One of the key objectives under the Renew Initiative is our partnerships with four school districts, including LA Unified School District. All four, all four districts are working to do early adoption and implementation of the National Institute of Medicine school meal recommendation, including reductions in sodium, limits on calories, and more fruits and vegetables. We are partnering with CFPA, California Food Policy Advocates, and the Urban Environmental Policy Institute to provide direct technical assistance with all four districts. As part of this effort here in LA County, we decided to launch a series of webinars that would support the implementation of the work school districts are doing to increase access to healthy food options, specifically effective strategies to support healthy menu changes and critical changes to the cafeteria environment. Today's webinar will focus on research-based lunchroom alterations and how they can influence student selection and consumption of healthier, food, healthier foods. Additionally, we hope participants will gain an understanding of how to increase the desirability of less popular but more nutritious menu items, as well as identify strategies that can help you introduce new, healthy menu items without experiencing a drop in participation. Before we get started, I wanted to quickly remind folks that we are in mute mode. Um, to the right, you should be able to see a control box on your screen, and this is really how you communicate with us. At the bottom, you should be able to see a questions box, and we really enc encourage webinar participants to submit questions beginning now um, all the way to the end of the presentation, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll be fielding questions um, to our presenters. I want to give one reminder, folks can limit the, um, if folks can limit the amount of programs that they have actually on their computer right now, so if you have Microsoft Word up or something like that, please um, uh, minimize programs that you have on your computer because it causes a lot of interference on the Internet. Well, we have a distinguished set of panelists today. Um, we're joined today by Dr. Brian Wansing, Professor of Marketing in the Charles H. Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management at Cornell University, and he is the director of the Cornell Food and Brand Lab. He is the author of the best-selling book, Mindless Eating, Why, Why We Eat More Than We Think. 
We also have today Dr. David Just is an associate professor in the Charles H. Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management at Cornell University. His work on behavioral economics and the school lunch program has shown how low-cost solutions can lead school children to make healthier choices without reducing overall availability of choices. And then finally, we have Denise Agati, who became the interim school lunch director for the Ithaca City School District in September 2010 after working for the district for over 25 years. Her goal through the years has always been to provide the children with healthy meals, and as director, she has now has the opportunity to implement her ideas. So I'm actually going to hand this over to Dr. Wansink and Dr. Just, who will be sharing um, their work on behavioral economics in the lunchroom and various effective strategies. Dr. Wansink and Dr. Just. Hey, thank you very much. So I, I'm Brian Wansink, and I'll uh, start off, and then Professor Just will pick up. We are so delighted to be a part of this today, particularly because you have them select what we think are our high school graduation photos. <laughs> We're going, man, that's great. So we're pleased that, and what we'll be doing is I'll be talking about some of the different things that luncheons can do for less than 50 bucks, and then turn over to Professor Just, who will talk about a couple more of those. And we'll do some kind of interesting, he'll do a little um, real-time case study where we'll show you some photos of some lunchrooms, and uh, you can kind of make them over in the privacy of your own office as, as we talk about them all together. Now, if you've got a piece of paper and a pencil, I just want you to write one thing down before we get started. Because it's going to be <clears throat> something we'll refer back to again and again and again. And it's the website smarterlunchrooms.org. Smarterlunchrooms.org. And a lot of the stuff we talk about will fly by. And you might say, gee, that was kind of cool, but I don't really remember that much. You can go to that website and, and take a look at this stuff in more detail. Well, the Smarter Lunchroom uh, movement sort of kicked off about three years ago when uh, Professor uh, Just and I were working on something. We'd, we would, up until that time, had been doing a lot of work in school lunchrooms, trying to come up with cheap, easy ways to get kids to eat better without taking away choice and all the time increasing participation. Something happened really strange about three, about three years ago. In that we got a call from the New York State Department of Health. And they said, you know, we're giving a bunch of $4,000 fellowships or grants to these schools way, way, way up north in New York, uh, Saranac, uh, Plattsburgh, you know, like up by Canada. So we're giving all these grants, three to $4,000. <clears> and the purpose is to get schools to increase food sales by 5%, you know, 5% more apples or bananas or pears or you know, lychee fruit or whatever they're selling. And then they said, we want to ask you, how much do we need to cut the price of fruit to increase sales by 5%? And we were kind of looking at each other and said, you know, gee, it's, it's almost kind of free anyway. You know, some people, it's, <clears throat> they're once they're subsidized, other people, you know, their parents are paying for it. You know, kids aren't going to realize it. 10% difference in price. They're not going to realize if you cut the price of fruit from 50 cents to 45 or from 50 cents down to 30. And so what we did instead, though, is he said, let's take a look at things. <clears throat> we took two groups up to six hours away, spent two or three nights up there, <clears throat> and, and all the days going to different school lunchrooms. And what we found is that the typical school lunchroom would have its fruit in these sort of these nasty steel chafer dishes that look like something you'd find in, in surgery or something. And uh, it'd be under a sneeze shield. So a person who wanted an apple would have to kind of contort themselves and you know a, a dark part of the line to reach under and grab a pale orange orange um, just to get a piece of fruit. And we said, you know, don't change the price. Here's what you do. Put the fruit in a nice bowl or any bowl for that matter, and put it in a well at part of the line. And I think there were seven schools there, and four or five did just that, and instead of seeing a 5% increase in sales, by simply putting that fruit in a nicer bowl and putting it in a well at part of the line, they, they realized about a 103% increase in fruit. And uh, two other schools didn't do anything because they said it's not going to work. So their fruit sales went up 
exactly zero percent. And it, it got us on this idea of the smarter lunchroom movement that there's a lot of changes that can be made very easily in school lunchrooms that cost nothing and can move the dial very quickly without alienating anybody, without necessitating an act of Congress or massive retraining of people. So can I go to the next slide, please? Can we? Thank you. So what's the smarter lunchroom? Well, the smarter lunchroom movement seeks to sort of nudge choices to take research-based findings that we have and, and, and use those to help people make smarter, healthier choices in the lunchroom. We want to increase the sales of the good stuff, offer a high variety of foods, and more importantly, increase participation. Because one thing we found over and over again is when we go in school, schools and we see the kids who aren't eating school lunches, um, especially at the junior high and high school level, it seems to us that three out of four times they're not eating the school lunch, they are not eating very healthy at all. They're either skipping lunch, they're having a big bag of Funyuns and a Mountain Dew, or they're having <laughs> they're having Domino's being delivered to a side door. They are not eating better than the typical person eats school lunch. And that's what we want to increase. And the way we do this, we go to smarter lunchrooms. Um, the way we help we can help schools do this in a number of ways. But an easy way we're making it very simple for schools is we're encouraging them just to make one or two changes per year. And um, when you go to our website, we'll tell you what the two changes are that seem to be working best over a lot of schools. We tell you exactly how to do them, and we show you how you can end up being a hero once you actually accomplish these things. Next slide, please. What makes lunchroom smarter? Well, <clears throat> it's not necessarily in having more nutrition information, although that's not bad. It's not necessarily having classes on nutrition, although that's not bad. Um, it's not necessarily getting rid of any sort of more indulgent choice, because um, that just makes it sort of a greenhouse that when students step out of on their way to college, uh, they'll fall all the harder. What it entails is doing simple things like changing spatial arrangements that essentially leverage behavioral economics. It uh, necessitates changing in some ways the way people pay, when they pay, when they commit to a food. And it also changes sort of the, the trendiness or the, um, because the, the fattiness of things. We, we know that fad, F-A-D. <laughs> yeah. So one, one thing we know, you know, if you, I remember a number of years ago, there's this TV show called Friends, and I, I don't think everybody really saw it, but I know everybody else in the universe is watching it. And so a reporter wanted to ask me what it would take to make Americans eat tofu. And I remember saying, you know, if you got those three girls and friends to eat tofu every fifth episode, within a season, half of America, or <laughs> half, half their demographic would be eating tofu. And with, with these kids, junior high kids, high school kids, you know, they want to be individualistic, but they definitely follow the pack. And so to make something cool can also make something healthy cool is also something you can get it, uh, consumed. And that's the fourth thing we talk about is social and communicative influences. Next slide. So there's six basic principles we're going to talk about today. In reality, there's many more than six principles, but this will be enough to maybe absorb initially. Um, the first one is, is simply to manage portion sizes. Second is going to be to increase convenience of the healthy foods, improve the visibility of the healthy foods, enhance taste expectations. The whole idea there is that if you think, if you make somebody believe something's going to taste good, they typically think it's better than if you didn't do that. We're going to utilize, utilize suggestive selling and then we're going to talk about setting sort of smart pricing strategies. And then after that, as I said, Professor Jess is going to be talking about some really neat little uh, kind of real-time case studies. Next slide, please. Now, it's not really any surprise that large portions create large tummies. <laughs> so and look at I mean, I, I, God, I'm a, if I would have just eaten, I would want that, that uh, taco thing right there. But um, 
smaller portions also lead people to end up eating less. But it's, it's not simply um, the, the size of the burrito that we give kids or, or it's something like that, but it also ends up being a lot of the extras. I mean, we find that if you serve croutons in a big vat, it pretty much leads to, you know, crouton salad instead of a salad with croutons. <laughs> and we see this with those little squeeze bottles too. It's, man, it's unbelievable <clears throat> how much people squeeze. Um, we're doing a really cool thing here at Cornell. They want to <clears throat> figure out how to reduce waste. And one of the things we're looking at is even going to some of the different entrees and changing the size of the serving spoons that we, they have in different entrees at the, at the cafeteria here. Because in some of our earlier research at Ice Cream Socials, we found that if you use a slightly larger scoop, people end up taking 14% more, serving themselves 14% more. And with any self-serve item, it's an it's a easy way to, to change things. Next slide. Uh, the second thing, and like I said, even on a website, we've got tons of examples of these different things and, and tons of ways to do it. What, I'll, what we'll do here is we'll just give one or two examples in the spirit of time. Um, increasing convenience, just making healthy food more convenient. We worked with an incredible, incredible food service director um, in addition to Denise, and this woman's name is Chris Wallace. And in one of her schools, what we ended up doing is creating these, uh, these convenient lines. That, you know, they're shorter lines, all they sold was healthy food, and you could get in and get out, which is what kids want more than anything, is to hang out with their friends, not to wait in line. But by making only healthy foods available in that convenient line, it helped a lot. Uh, next slide, please. And here you, get, you can see how excited these kids are about waiting in line. <laughs> Isn't that too? If they could riot, they would. You know. um, and and uh, simply having these healthy convenience lines in the, in the studies we ran with, with Chris Wallace, we found that it decreased overall unhealthy food sales by 27% while increasing total sales um, in, in general. It was very successful. Next. Slide, please. In terms of improving visibility, a, a basic principle, whether this be in your, your house or whether it be the candy dish you know, in your office or whether it be lunch lines that if something's out of sight, out of mind. In, in some of the work we did earlier, we, we found that if you take a person's candy dish and you put it in the top drawer of their desk rather than on top of their desk, it decreased how much the typical person ate from about nine candies down to like uh, a little less than three per day. Well, you wonder why more people don't do that. <laughs> right. um, and the same thing we found here is that we talked about the fruit dish, having the fruit dish out there. We're in a well-lit part of the line. We found the same thing with all sorts of other sort of examples. And I think, um, and it can be, you may want to have the ice cream out there <clears throat> because if you don't, there's going to be a riot. But one thing you can do is instead of having a clear glass cooler, just put some contact paper over the top of that. And that way the people who really want it can get it and they won't complain. But the people who don't really need it and don't really want it, but see, can I go, ooh, ice cream, won't be tempted to get it. Next slide, please. So you notice here we've got, you notice, notice how the fruits are kind of hidden versus we make them out in, out in the open. It's, a, it's an easy thing to do and it's, it's crazy how much it increases sales. Next slide, please. Now here's an example of something that <clears throat> was kind of interesting. This was um, a school in, yeah, Corning, New York. Corning, as in like Corning wear, okay. And uh, they had a middle school called the Free Academy, and they had a problem where um, they didn't have, they had pretty anemic salad bar sales. And I, I think they were trying to figure out what, whether they should re decrease the price of salad in order to get people, more people to buy it, or whether they should instead add fun stuff to the salad bar, like those little bitty miniature corns that, you know, like Barbie would eat and things like that. <laughs> and we went and took a look at things. If you see that, you see the, what the lunch looks like. There's a door in the upper right hand corner and then there's the a la carte items with the top end of, of, of the 
lunch room, the hot lunch line is on the left, and there are two cash registers, and the salad bar is on the right. And we went in there, and what was discovered was that simply by relocating the salad bar to the middle of the room, when that happened, they experienced 200 to 300% sales in salad. Because they didn't change the salad bar at all. They just moved to the middle of the room so that poor kids would kind of walk up there and run into it. And they'd go, oh. And most of the time, they'd go around it. And occasionally, they'd stop and, and pick something up. Next slide, please. And um, I'll talk about two more, and then we'll turn it over to Professor Just. Um, when you look at any enhanced taste expectations, we find that the biggest determinant of, of how much somebody likes something, you know, whether it be whether it be the Thanksgiving dressing that, that you make at home, you know, whether it be uh, the, the, the strange candy bar from a strange country that somebody brings back vacation because you taste of. The biggest determination of how much you're going to like something is what you expect it's going to taste like before you taste it. And we do things terribly wrong in a lot of schools. Uh, we've been in schools where the first thing you see when you walk up to the line is a garbage can. Man, what's that do for your taste expectations? It doesn't make you say, this is going to be great. Uh, and, and I think the same way, the more care that's taken with presenting food in a very sort of appealing way, the more sort of hardwires your taste buds to believe it was really good. And one way we've done this, if you go to the next slide, please, we've done a couple studies where we've simply changed the names of things. And we call it the name game. Just, you know, in elementary schools calling x-ray carrots, or called carrots, x-ray vision carrots, doubles the amount of carrots. Or in, one, in, in, in one case, we were at uh, with Denise, working with Denise, I got his school for a special on Channel One. Is that what's called? Ch it, was Channel the, one. it was in the invite that everybody got. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Channel. We were doing a. We were doing something for there, and we were going to change the name of the the burritos, and people wanted to change the name from bean burritos to big bad bean burritos, which sounded big bad and stupid to us. But <laughs> we did it, and and it looked like sales increased more than forty percent. And I guess you can see that in, on YouTube or wherever it's at right now. Oh, yeah, and, and from what, what Adam Brumberg says, they're going to be sending it out with um, after, the, after the presentation, too. It's going to be really neat. So that gives a little bit of idea of some of the stuff we're going to be doing. Now, the next two changes Dr. David Just will talk about, and then he'll, he'll take us um, up to sort of a um, the real-time simulation, if you will. Okay, so please advance to the next slide. And thank you, Brian. Uh, so, so what we say and how we act as uh, as not necessarily as food service directors, but as as uh, you know, people actually on the lunch line can have a big impact on on uh, what the kids decide to buy. I, it's a classic case of this. I, you know, every time you go to McDonald's and you order something, if you haven't ordered your fries or your drink, they will immediately ask you, "Do you want your fries and your drink?" And, and they do this for a reason, because it sells fries and drinks. <laughs> and uh, alternatively, we, we can think about using that same type of, of prompt to try and get kids to eat a little bit healthier. So for example, asking a kid if they want fruit will often, will often lead them to take the fruit. In fact, you see about a 70% increase in the amount of fruit kids take if you just ask them this. It's not nearly as high for, for fruits and vegetables, or excuse me, for vegetables, but, but for fruits, it's extremely effective. And, and moreover, it's a little bit in how you do it. You've got to be a little bit friendly. When, when kids think the school lunch staff is friendlier, they buy more often, they participate more often, but they also end up buying better foods, believe it or not. Would you want to tell a little bit about that? So yeah, in a national, in a national uh, survey of, of uh, children who participate in, in uh, either participate in school lunch or do not participate, when they when they believe that the school lunch staff is friendlier, we see them buying more fruits and more vegetables. We see them buying milk more often. 
we see them end, ending up getting a healthier lunch overall. Alternatively, if they think the school lunch staff is unfriendly, they tend to sort of drop away and they end up bringing their lunch from home. And, and usually what they're bringing from home is not nearly as healthy. So not only is participation going down, which is bad for the school lunch program, but also the healthfulness, the, the nutrition that they're getting is just not what you want it to be. Um, but beyond that, you don't have to just say, would you like it with it, and let them say yes or no. This is one school we went to and we saw as they were going through the line, this one lunch lady, she would hold the tray out for them. They'd, they'd have the pizza and they'd say, would you want a salad with that? And she'd stare at them and hold that tray <laughs> until they gave them an answer. And, uh, and of course, the kids ended up taking the salad a lot more often. I, I can't say you know, in particular whether that ended up having a, a huge impact on what was consumed. We didn't look at that, but at least what was taken, it had a big impact, and I assume it did have an impact on what, was, uh, what it was eventually consumed. Uh, can you advance to the next slide? Okay, uh, just just a quick point, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Here you see a, a few different, uh, well, a few different posters from schools, as well as a couple of other pictures of of uh, partially clothed women with water bottles. Um, <laughs> and celebrities. They're celebrities. Thank you. Uh, and what are they doing here? Well, they're they're trying to show you that these foods are cool, right? Uh, having a poster up that tells you. This food will be good for your eyes, and your vision will last into your your you know 70s, 80s. It's probably not going to connect with kids, but having this sort of image, uh, in in some schools we found it effective to try and bring in, you know, the the favorite school athlete, the star quarterback or whoever, and actually serve on the lunch line. It creates a connection to the good food, to the food that they are selling, and uh, and the kids enjoy it. So. Use some signage. Use something that, that projects the image of what you know what they uh, the kids want to be. Because when they identify with that image, they're going to identify it with that food, and you can tilt them towards taking the healthier food. Uh, can, can you advance to the next slide? What's the website again? The, uh, <laughs> the website. Yes. Yeah, so, so again, a lot of these principles are on our website at smarterlunchrooms.org. So please please don't hesitate to go there and take a look. Giving them a choice. Kids, if you tell them what to do, they end up rebelling. And we see this over and over again. They, uh, we've seen this at many, many different schools. One, one school in particular where they were told they could only have one ketchup packet, they rebelled and, and uh, filled, filled the principal's uh, pockets with ketchup packets over the next little bit. Um, and, and to give you a little bit of an example, you know, I've got several kids of my own. If I, if I tell, yeah, four, four of them to be exact, if, uh, if I tell one of my kids, it's 8 o'clock, go to bed, I've got a fight on my hands. But if I tell them, it's 7.30, would you like to go to bed now, or would you like to watch a television show and then go to bed in a half hour, they end up choosing to go to bed at 8 o'clock, and they end up liking it. So even if you're giving them some bit of a meaningless choice, it ends up having a pretty good impact here. And we, we, we notice here, you know, when we tell them to eat carrots, we don't get very many that eat it. Well, we get a reasonable amount. It's about 69%. But if you just ask them, do you want carrots or the celery, we get about 91% that eat it. And it's not because people like celery. It's because they're choosing the carrots over the celery. And when they choose it, they own that choice, and they decide to eat it. So offer some choice. Give them something that they can, they can buy into on their own. Uh, could you advance to the next slide? So, um, so here we, we uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but you know, almost all schools have switched over to some sort of debit system now. And what the debit system does, at least if it's, if it's unchecked, it puts a whole bunch of money resources in the hands of the kid as they go through that school lunch line that they wouldn't have had before. So where before, I'm limited to buying just what I can with what's in my pocket, now my parents may be loading on months of, of worth of meals on my card or my debit account, and I'm walking through, and I can feel free to load on the a la carte items because they're not going to notice. If, if we want to have you know, a little bit more control over this and, and sort of recreate the older system, at least the controls that were on it, 
without getting rid of the convenience, because because there are a whole bunch of big advantages in terms of time and in terms of anonymity and, and what have you with these debit card systems or debit systems. One thing you can do is have some items that are for cash only, or you can try, and there are great systems out there, and make sure that the parents have some bit of control over what items your kids can and can't purchase with that debit system, or at least give them some feedback as to what their kids have been purchasing. We find that the, that sort of feedback is extremely effective. We, we've been doing several different experiments with that. It just doesn't take much to empower the parents to teach their kids and get them to, to, to behave healthier. Um, please advance. Okay, and so the most effective way to try and implement these changes, you, you don't want to just necessarily go into your lunchroom and just willy-nilly implement everything that we're talking about. Because uh, a lot of times we're doing things pretty well to begin with. So really we recommend these sort of four steps. Is going through, thinking about these principles while you're walking through your own lunchrooms. Take a kid's eye view and look and see what's there and what it's telling you to buy what it's telling you to eat. After that, write down your thoughts and think about prescribing what the fixes or the remedies to some of the, some of the things you're seeing would be, and then implement. But when you implement, don't just implement and blindly believe it, it did everything all right, because you know, even, even we will make mistakes now and again <laughs> in believing that something's going to work for a problem and it, it just ends up backfiring in some strange way. Um, and, I guess you'll see ex at least one example of that if you watch that video we were talking about. Um, although most of what we talked about works there. Uh, you want to evaluate. You want to actually track how much is being eaten. If you have the ability to, you want to track how much is being thrown away as well. Because it becomes really important to know that you're having an impact, the impact that you want. That it's still maintaining participation and it's actually nutritious because the kids are eating it. Okay. Uh, Please advance to the next slide. There we go. And so this is just a, another little, before I start our, our diagnosis and evaluation process, this is a little plug for, first for our website again, just make sure you know it's there, smarterlunchrooms.org, but uh, also this is a, an op-ed piece that we did in the New York Times. Uh, it's probably pretty difficult to read on the size screen, at least that we have. And, and, uh, I don't know if it's a resolution you can quite see. But if you go to that website, there's a copy of this. And this has you know, about a dozen different small changes based on these principles that we've been able to execute and, and their results. It also gives you a little bit more of our philosophy. Um, I, I'd encourage you to go ahead and take a look at that. It's, it was a wonderful piece. The New York Times was very kind to us to allow us to do that. Um, let's let's go ahead and look at some of these uh, situations that we can diagnose. Can you, can you advance to the next slide? And, and I should mention this is from one of the schools. I believe there's a participant uh, from this school on on the call here. Uh, although we won't be able to hear from him or her. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for this, and and uh, don't take offense at anything we're about to say. <laughs> we're we're just trying to use this as an example. So this. Uh, we're going to talk about a few things that we like and a few things that we're, we may be a little bit concerned with. And, and I, I'm sitting here also with Adam Brumberg, and he might jump in uh, now and again to point me in the right direction if I miss something. Uh, this, first, uh, this first example we see, you know, they've, they've taken some food and, and trying to do something a little bit different. They've moved it outside, uh, it looks like, where the students are. And the, the first thing you notice when you look at this, yeah, it's a, it's a good idea to get the food out somewhere and make it be a little bit innovative that way. But you worry a little bit about the presentation in this case. Uh, you know, the food is set up on these milk crates down by the ground. Um, it, it's saying something about, you know, inevitably it's saying something about the taste, right? Uh, it's, it's also out of sight. It's something that's hard for kids to see. If I'm walking by this and I'm thinking about picking something up, it's either I cr crouch down really low and pick some of these things up, or I grab the one thing over there on the right that is near my height. Um, and so, so, you know, while I think this is an innovative attempt, you know, it might be better to just get a, get a little table or something like that that you could set out there, maybe with a tablecloth, something that presents it and makes it look looks homey or makes it look a little more inviting. 
something like a picnic, right? Um, it's not. It, it's not just for the people who are eating, but it's for the people who are working too. Who are eating? And yeah. You want to get them to exactly. It becomes more violent. It's not just the people who are eating. It's the people right that you're trying to get to to eat. And I believe that this school had some some real issues with space, which is what, part of why they're going outside. Um, so, but I think they're making you know they're making the best of a of a of a, uh, of a difficult situation. But there's a few things maybe they could just do to enhance that somewhat. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know. Tables, tablecloths tend not to cost too much. Even without the tablecloth, the table they might just have one floating around the school somewhere. Um, let's, let's go ahead and advance to the next slide. Okay, so the next couple slides are from the same line. Uh, and, and here, you know, on the left, you see sort of a kid's eye view of, of what you see as you walk through. My computer just went completely black. Yeah, okay, so good. <laughs> um, so you see this kid's eye view, and when you're seeing this kid's eye view, what do you see, right? You see a, a little bit of foil in a really deep pit off to the left, um, and you see some chips floating around up high down the line. Um, further, if you walk in and you sort of look in, you can see these, these sandwiches that are wrapped up. It's sort of hard to tell what's what. Uh, they're, they're not really labeled. Um, it looks like there's some sub sandwiches that are a little bit closer, and some other things that are you know just wrapped up, maybe burgers or something. Um, in any case, when you have something that's that deep, it makes it so it's a little bit less convenient to grab it, and that can uh, that can make it so a few kids who might be indifferent can uh, you know just won't be able to overcome that that. Uh, that little bit of inconvenience, and believe it or not, that can have a big impact, like 15, 20 percent, just by raising that up to to eye level in some way, or or to you know just right within reach. As well, putting a little label on it, or or a sign out in front to tell you what's in there, so so nobody's picking something up and saying, well, I don't know if I really know what this is, and and it may be what I want, but it may not be, so I won't take the risk, right? A few things like that can really make a big difference. If you have a deep pit like that, that might be a good place to place uh, some of the, the foods that you're trying not to sell. Okay, let's, uh, let's go on to the next slide. So here you see some of the, uh, you know, some of the drinks that are available. I'm just going to mention the, the chocolate milk. It's, it's nice. It's in the back. It is a little less convenient, but there's tons and tons of it. So it's sort of signaling to you that along with all the Gatorade out in front sort of signaling to you that you're somewhat of a freak if you're taking the white milk. Um, you're, <laughs> you're just not in the norm. And so, you know, even if you're not selling all of it, it's a good idea to try and make it look like the white milk is more prevalent. That it's, it's a little bit more normal. It looks like we're, we're running out of time. I want to hit uh, one last slide. So advance two slides if you could. I, there's some nice signage, by the way, on campus cuisine. It really sets up a nice, nice uh, outcome. We like those individual containers to, in the previous slide for the for the, the with the naming of the taco. Oh yeah, just go back to that for one second. Sure, sure. Yeah. So you see the, the on the left the the labeled containers. This this is a great way to do things. This grab and go really makes it convenient. It really does amp up the sales of healthier foods like salads or healthier subs. So it just this is a great job, and we we should mention great job. Right. So. Keep on going then. The next one. Uh, okay. And here's another attempt outside. And again, this is just a great idea to have this outside a little bit closer to where the kids are. Um, again, however, there's this, this idea of balance between the healthier and the less healthy items where there is a lot of, of things that look a little bit like Gatorade to me in there and, and some other things like that. And so just a little bit of care to make sure that you're pushing the healthier stuff. Um, and I, I guess I've got to call it quits right here. I want to remind you, I guess in advance the last slide, and you'll see a little bit of our smarterlunchrooms.org again. Remind you, head off to this website and, and feel free. You see a, a link there to contact us. If you have questions, if, if you want to get in touch with us about these sorts of things or are interested in, in participating in a study like this, please give us, a, give us an email. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wansink and, and Dr. Just. Um, we will now hear from Denise Agati to share some of the strategies her district has adopted and, and implemented and share some of her own observations. Denise?
Denise, are you there? Can you hear me now? There you are. Hello. Hi. Hand it over Denise. to you. Okay, thank you. My name is Denise and I work for the Ithaca City School District and I participated in the behavioral economics at the work in the school lunchrooms. I had the pleasure of working with David Justin and Brian Wansink in Channel One News. Um, we are from a school district made up of 14 different schools. Next slide. Next slide. And about 5,300 students and 34% of free and reduced um, meals we um, have participating. Next slide. Um, we had the uh, professionals, we conduct, conducted this um, experiment here and we started out with our lunch line presentation and let the professors come in and do our lunch line makeover. Um, next slide. Um, with the result, this Channel One News, they came in, we did with our presentation after we got the experiment results with the Channel One News and with the changes from Brian Wansink and Professor David Jest, we upped our fruit consumption by 102%, which was major. Just by moving the fruit to the end of the line by the register and putting the healthier foods out front so that they could be uh, visual and be seen. Next slide. Next slide. Um, after we did conduct this experiment, we started with our one school, Boynt Middle School. We made a lot of small changes throughout the schools, and they're not big, big changes. It's just by adding some bowls and putting the fruits and vegetables visual and using a lot of colors. Um, we de um, in our school, we decreased um, the convenient food so that they couldn't reach them and put the fruit bowls in front. Oh, next slide. Um, to improve the visibility of the healthy items. Um, with the tastings, we put the healthier items at the front of the line so they had a choice to look at it so they weren't just visualing pizza and it gave them a chance to decide whether they want to take the healthier um, entre entree or not. That's where the big bad burritos came in and just by naming them, we sold the day we did a second experiment, they sold out <laughs> for the first time. Um, next slide. Um, by placing um, the, the snacks out of reach so that the ch um, children and students couldn't reach them, they now have to ask at the registers for the different snacks and stuff. In front of the snacks, we put the fruit. So they have to reach, actually reach over the fruit and juice and milk, the healthier items to where they can't reach the snacks. Um, next slide. One of the, here's the, it shows the picture of the before where we had pizza at first and the second line and the second after where the big bad um, bean burritos were placed. Next slide. Um, when you're placing your white and chocolate milk, we increased our white milk consumption just by adding more so it didn't look empty, the milk, or it didn't look like it was all chocolate milk as showed in the pictures viewed before. So our milk, the white milk increased. Okay, next slide. And here it shows where we added um, the fruit bowls in front of the snack, so as they come through the end of the line, they could grab a fruit with their lunch. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. And here's a before and after picture with the hotel pan into a beautiful fruit bowl. Okay. Next slide. 
Next slide. Okay, and actually here we have a picture of our the for the chili and with the naming of the carrots. The little signs help out a lot so the students know what you are serving before they actually come through the line. We did add a few different names to our items. Um, Krabby Patty was for a, fi for a fish sandwich, and the little kids think they're cute. And the Gooey Chewy Grilled Cheese Sandwich, actually that was a name. We had a contest, contest where a student had a chance to name a sandwich, and we drew a name, and she won the naming of the sandwich. Next slide. And actually, very the friendly servers, <laughs> that helps out 100% because no child wants to be afraid of your cafeteria server or cashier. And it helps to suggestive selling is very important because no child wants to be the first to ask for the healthier entree. And if you just, if you offer it, then they're more apt to take it. Next slide. So all together with all these, the help from Brian and David, we have increased our fruits and vegetable consumption and have um, cut back a little bit on the um, unhealthy choices. Next slide. Okay, and overall, just to let you know, all these changes were simple and cost effective. It's all about choice of the student, so we're not forcing them of what they have to eat. They have their, um, we're offering the healthier options and making them more available. So I think it's helped out greatly having the professors here to show us the different ways to improve our lunch lines, lunch line redesign. And thank you. Well, thanks, Denise, so much for your presentation. And I once again want to thank Dr. Wonsink and Dr. Just for their amazing presentations. These are such effective, tangible strategies and solutions to really help districts around the country um, as they make healthy menu changes. And they also work to adopt and implement the, the, I, the Institute of Medicine recommendations and the proposed regulations that the USDA just came out with. So um, I, I'm sure this has been a, an amazing presentation for, for folks. And I once again encourage folks to go to the websites that um, have been um, outlined in this presentation to look for more effective strategies. We're going to turn now to questions and answers, and I, I um, want to remind folks that on your control panel, um, there is a box that you can type in some questions, and I, I, I think we already have a couple. Am I correct? So just want to want to remind folks, um, once again, there is a questions box on the bottom of your control panel, and just type in a question, and, and we'll field that to our, our panelists. Okay, are these to all of us? So the first question is for Brian and David. Um, in evaluation of these strategies, are you measuring what students are actually eating and consuming as well as what they're selecting? Oh, ah, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, the answer is yes. Um, in that Again, we see it's not nutrition until it's eaten. The first step is getting it taken. The second step is getting it eaten. So, yeah, we, we do some studies. I mean, usually our pilot studies, we're just looking at sales. And then once we start doing a real study, we have people in there measuring how much is being eaten, how much is being thrown away. In fact, we just completed a study up in a, a, an elementary school, Lansing Elementary School near here, where uh, we, we were going in and we, we took every tray and measured plate waste from every kid in the in in the entire school. It every was, single item. Every single item by itself, and it it was time consuming. But this is this is what you got to do to figure out whether they're really eating it, whether it's really a successful strategy. Or not. <laughs> Great. We have another question. Um, if we were to pilot a lunchroom remarket remarketing campaign. On what scale would you recommend ob observing, implementing, and evaluating? 
Well, initially, um, like we've worked with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and they've taken they've taken six of our more general suggestions, and they've actually woven them in as part of the uh, what they recommend for the uh, U.S. Healthier School Challenge. So they, they've already taken six of our ideas and actually made them principal. Um, and those would be a good place to start, but you can get it'd be like going on a diet. If somebody says, "Here's ten things to do to go on a diet," and you think Oh, well, nine would make perfect sense, but that tenth one sounds kind of weird for me. You'll use that as an excuse not to go on a diet. So what we would suggest in terms of scale is uh, you can get these basic principles off our website, smarterlunchrooms.org. Um, find the three or four that actually seem to work okay for you and start there. Don't try to transform your entire life overnight. I think this question goes to all of the speakers. Are you aware of any federal or state funding to support program changes such as you presented today? So, so uh, there is this Healthier U.S. School Challenge that, that provides some uh, incentives for being able to maintain levels of participation, uh, being able to get certain types of, of fruits and vegetables in, in the diet. Um, so up to two thousand dollars, I believe, per school. I, there are also some other pieces that I think don't have to do specifically with with food. It has to do more with PE and other things like that. But the good news is, almost everything we've mentioned here is something you can implement with almost no money. I mean, we we try to put this together so that these are low cost or no cost changes. Um, some of these just take the effort of moving something from one part of the line to the other. Some require a small investment of maybe you know ten to thirty dollars, something like that. So it, it, there's a lot you can do without the grant or without any sort of uh, funding, but there are some ways you can get some funding uh, through what you're doing. Yes, we had a school in one of our districts that was not part of one of our studies, and they she had gotten together with the uh, with the food service directors from the other schools, and was so excited about what the results that they were having. This woman, without any any input from us or from any grant or anything, got her staff together. They went to Walmart. They spent one hundred and forty dollars, and they did they did the exact same thing to their lunchroom that the, the people who had been involved in the study did. And they had uh, we didn't get to measure their stuff, but their anecdotal results are just as good as everybody else's. It's you know it's it's once you you take the time to think through the the, the steps, it's simple and it's cheap. One more thing is we had a last spring we kept track of the different schools who were uh, who were actually being made over and asked them to calculate exactly how much they spent in their makeover and the average amount was thirty eight dollars. That's total. Most of we have another time. we have another question and it's directed to Denise. Um, how were the changes, um, uh, cafeteria changes implemented in the la in your school district communicated to parents, if any? Um, I put a lot of it, a lot of information. I tried to send out to the stu or to the parents is on the back of the menu to keep them updated, and that's my communication to the parents. And that's how I worked with the naming of the sandwiches. Everything was pretty much on the menu where I could my communication to the parents. Um, and I e actually even put the study as Brian and David came in. I advertised that on the back of the menu. And that's a big part of my communication. And we also have a, a website that we have a lot of communication on with the menus and everything on it. Great. Um, this is directed to, to Brian and to David. Um, what research has been done related to using trays versus plates? And then what color trays have been proven best? Uh, really interesting question. We've actually got a, a bit of research that shows it, it's not so much the color as it is the contrast with the food that you're serving. That uh, you know, if, if there's a big contrast with the food that you're serving, people sort of overestimate how much is there and they tend to eat a little bit less. Whereas if there's not much of a contrast, they're going to eat the whole thing. And right if they're right. dishing it themselves, <laughs> they'll they'll dish a lot more on their plate. Um, and with, and with trays, we we are we're big believers in trays for a couple of different reasons. First, because we're really into that what's that called like uh, 
Yeah, we're in, the, we're in that environmental sustainable, thing. sustainable environmentally. <laughs> well, that's it. That's it. That's it. So we're really, we're really into that. And we just, we think it's such a scam with the uh, all the, uh, the um, you know, a lot of the throwaway styrofoam trays. But that's we're, that's we're more believers because of that. But we're also believers because we think it actually can guide people to actually eat a little bit better because of the and particular trays are designed in a certain way, which we can talk more about in another situation. But one thing we also find about trays in our lunchrooms is that trays help kids eat better in balance. Without a tray, the kid's got two hands. Instead of getting a salad and an entree and dessert, he's going to get the entree and the dessert, not the salad. Well, I think we'll take a couple more questions. Um, the next question, I think, is really to all of our presenters. Do the effects of these strategies last over time? Are they sustainable? Um, or can students adapt to these changes and revert to previous choices? I mean, for, Go ahead. From our point of view, there's from our point of view, they were simple and cost effective, so we still have them Im implemented. So we we've you know some of these we've tested more thoroughly than others, and uh, and there is the question of you know do the kids end up adapting, and so does the effect go away after a little while, and uh, and and certainly you know with some of these, not all of them, we'll see a little bit of attenuation. For the most part, the the you know the effect persists, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so what we what we tend to find is the first month, what happens if you were to make a change in the first month, what, there'll be an overreaction. But what happens is that after that first month, um, things pretty much dampen down to a point where there's a, a solid increase that persists. Like let's get I'll, when I talk about the fruit bowls. Initially, when we, we make these changes with fruit bowls, fruit bowl. Remember, I tell you, fruit sales and going up about 103 percent, but initially they'll go up 300, 400 percent in the first week, two or three weeks, just that they come down after that to a sell, you know, 103 percent increase. And ours is still going good. Fruit's still going great. Yay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll do, we're going to take a few more questions, um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up and do next steps. Um, do you find that using the word healthy isn't optimum? for encouraging purchases from young people. I noticed a healthy express line on one of the slides. Perhaps just express line would be better. Or fresh express. We find fresh works OK. Healthy doesn't work very well. I, healthy is what we put in the, the academic papers talking about that, not the <laughs> <laughs> So no, you're exactly right. Um, healthy is not a good word to use. I don't care what age. It, it could be adults or children. You don't want to put healthy near food. Because people don't, don't, uh, they don't like it. <laughs> there are subsets for, for which it works, but yeah. And I think, that, and our final question, um, which I think is a good last question, is if you were going to do this in your district, what is the single most effective strategy that you've identified throughout your presentation today that has had the most impact? Friendly service. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think wow. friendly service does have a, a pretty big impact. That's absolutely true, and and it's I mean, it's cost effective, right? I mean, it doesn't it's cost very much. cost effective. Yes. Now we do have we have we do have have a conversation with food service directors. There's a lot about how to implement friendly service, um, which is a real challenge in some schools for sure. <laughs> uh, so so while, while we'll tell you it's it's very, very effective, we will also not tell you that it's the simplest thing to do necessarily. You don't pay me enough to be friendly. Right, right. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you know, Denise, Denise, uh, we know some of your staff, and I think you're you're uh, really you've done a really great job of uh, I, nudging them. I do. Thank you. But, um, not everybody is quite so lucky as far as that goes, but you know, some of the some of the reordering and the the, the visibility things, I think, are, are kind of the simplest and and uh, most most tried and true methods that, uh, that we work with. Well, great. Thanks so much, everybody, for participation today. On once again, thanks, Dr. Just, Dr. Wansink, and Denise Agati. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll commit. There was a handful of other questions that were identified through the chat box, and what we'll do is maybe we can, if you're okay, we'll send them to all of our panelists, and maybe we can send those out through email. Some of the answers. Um, but we, the next slide here we have is we wanted to share some critical resources. Um, our county website, our Renew School Meals blog, which has some great resources um, for parents and for food services directors. 
um, Smarter Lunchrooms, which has been outlined today on, on our webinar, um, the Department of Public Health here in LA County's Choose Health LA website, and then um, our other two co-sponsors of our webinar today, CFPA and, and the Urban Environmental Policy Institute. Um, just quick next steps, I wanted to, um, I just, please look out in your email, uh, we're going to be sending out a follow-up email in the next um, few hours, which will include a link to um, a survey, we want to get your feedback on, on how the webinar was for you. Second, we'll include a, um, a link um, for the Renew blog, which, which we actually, on the previous slide, we actually have the website where you can go to, um, which is going to include the recording of this webinar and how to, how to um, view that. And then the third area is the video that um, Dr. Wansing and Dr. Just actually referenced throughout today's presentation. We will, we will be providing a link for that as well. Um, Keep your eye out on your, in your email inbox for invitations to the next webinar in our school nutrition policy webinar series. Anything, anybody else have anything to add? Well, great. Thank Thanks so much for Thank taking you. the time today, everybody. And we, we um, hope it was enjoyable for you. It was a great presentation. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon or morning. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.